Yeah, so thank you very much for the invitation, the warm welcome. I'm really glad to be here. I feel quite much at home for several reasons. One is that I used to be a Leipziger. Unfortunately, now I had to move to Hanover. So, but I spent quite uh, a few years, 15 years actually here in Leipzig. Um, and also uh, was frequently here a guest at Albertina and uh, the university library. But also another reason, I actually found out that uh, WUFINE stands for, uh, the WU, uh, VU stands for Villanova University. Before I came here to Leipzig, I was a postdoc um, at the University of Pennsylvania, and I lived with my wife very close to Villanova University in Exton, Pennsylvania. Uh, and we passed by Villanova University quite often. So um, also that um, created some some nice memories for me when um, I, I learned about it. So. Uh, I would like to talk a bit about your symbolic uh, discovery with knowledge graphs and uh, generative AI. So these are, I guess, big topics, and we need to see how can we bring maybe discovery, scientific discovery together with these uh, recent advances there, especially in, in generative AI. Knowledge graphs are out there already a bit longer. Uh, so that's what I want to talk about. And um, the work, some work I'm presenting was also done in the context of the German National Research Data Infrastructure. So you see here the logos of NFDI for, in, for engineering community, for data science, or for energy. Um, now I'm head of TRB in Hanover. So, and uh, you see TRB is um, uh, down here on the right-hand side. Um, you see the Leibniz University of Hanover on the left-hand side, the Valve Castle. Um, Hanover was a, a kingdom or princedom, and for uh, several hundred years also a personal union. Uh, the, the king or prince of Hanover was also king of, of England. Um, and you see a lot of Leibniz there in the names, yeah. Leibniz University of Hanover, Leibniz Information Center for Science and Technology. Um, actually, the Leibniz University of Hanover is not the only university having Leibniz in the name in Hanover. And also we as a library are not the only library in Hanover which has Leibniz in the name. There's also the Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz Library in Hanover. I guess the librarians, you all know this uh, even better than me. And that's why I prepared a small um, example, this, ambigu this ambiguating, um, actually these connections. So TIB, we are also library of uh, the Leibniz University of Hanover. Um, but we're also a member of Leibniz Association. It's one of the four uh, big research associations in Germany, um, in addition to Fraunhofer, Max Planck, Helmholtz. And uh, we have also this national role of serving communities in science and technology. And uh, for both, of course, uh, Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz was the namesake. Um, and he actually was born in Leipzig here. Yeah. So in the university, there's also a statue of Leibniz. So there are many connections. Um, and, uh, of course, Leibniz was also namesake for these famous cookies from Balsen, uh, which are made in, in Hanover. And what you see is already a, a small knowledge graph. Yeah, We have entities, relationships between these entities, um, and that's also a bit a part of my talk. And now I want to give you... Um, the other part of uh, or of the the other technology is generative AI. Yeah? So you all um, have used uh, ChatGPT, and um, when you asked, actually now it doesn't work anymore. But uh, a few months ago, it it still worked. When you asked ChatGPT, you are a journalist, write a summary of the developments around a widely publicized scandal involving Professor Auer. It came up with a huge long story um, and. Uh, wrote about misappropriation of research funds, plagiarism, data manipulation, and so on and so forth. Nothing of this luckily is true. And luckily, and I observed also a little bit at how ChatGPT was retrained, because in the beginning I could just ask, write about a scandal uh, involving Sören Auer, and it came up with a scandal two weeks later, it didn't work anymore. Um, and you see here, this is already tricking ChatGPT into writing something. I am telling him it should be a journalist. And there is this widely publicized um, uh, scandal, basically telling him there is something. Yeah. Um, and uh, But this also um, uh, tells us a little bit um, how um, language models and this generative AI um, works and uh, what are the, the problems or challenges there. Uh, maybe a few words um, how um, LLMs um, work. So they basically convert um, words or language or documents into uh, these vector representations called also embeddings. Um, 
And um, you see this here with the example of man, woman, boy, girl, prince, princess, queen, king, monarch. Um, so they all have uh, share, uh, or some of these concepts share certain things. Uh, some of these concepts, are, of course, also can be distinguished by certain things. And there is this uh, vector representation, for example, the dimensions are male, female, junior, senior, a noble, profane here, yeah. And uh, that's something which these embeddings basically learn. So we don't have to tell them exactly um, how this has to be categorized or classified, but um, the embeddings and uh, generative AI approaches learn how to categorize uh, these concepts and also documents and, and texts. And then they are basically allocated in such a multidimensional uh, feature space where we have, for example, age, gender, royalty as different dimensions. Yeah, we actually don't exactly know how it works because it's implicitly done um, by the embedding uh, model, these kind of um, dimensions. And that um, helps in the end because we um, don't have to tell uh, the models exactly what are synonyms, what are antonyms, but basically these embedding models learn it by, by themselves. A bit like our human brains. Also, we learn this step by step. You need to read probably to small kids a lot of stories. And after a few years, they also figure out what is male, what is female, what is noble, profane, and so on, yeah, uh, without uh, explicitly um, uh, having formal definitions of these kinds of concepts. And then um, language models are trained to predict basically the next words based on these um, um, vector representations and um, basically discover statistical patterns in the training data and um, yeah, resemble them then in the answers or in the, in the results. And uh, this, uh, in a way, also resembles a bit how we are thinking um, as, as humans. And there was this famous a book, or also uh, Daniel Kahneman won the Nobel Prize actually for his cognitive theories, um, and he um, postulated or discovered that uh, the cognitive abilities are that we we are thinking fast and slow. Yeah, and I would say that this generative AI resembles quite much what fast thinking means. Yeah, fast is we make intuitive um, decisions, for example, or come up with intuitive responses to certain questions. Thinking slow is more, we take our time, um, we split it into small steps, we reason about information, we use additional tools maybe to validate, verify uh, things. And I would say that generative AI can think fast, but not, not really slow. Um, but uh, this is something, of course, the slow thinking, we, we learned this as humans, but um, also we have developed a lot of means actually to mitigate our the deficiencies of our brains, yeah. So um, we believe a lot in false information. We make mistakes, um, um, and um, we but we have developed techniques like peer-reviewed books, articles, curated databases, experiments, simulations, and so on, um, to mitigate a bit the um, limitations of our um, natural uh, neural networks, right? And I think we need something similar also for generative AI. I think just with um, neural networks and with generative AI, we will not be able to solve everything, but we need also uh, basically this analogon of uh, peer review of article, uh, peer reviewed uh, curated databases, for example, experiments and simulations. And that's a bit what um, is subsumed under the term neurosymbolic um, AI. And um, we imagine that uh, knowledge graphs can play a key role there, basically mitigating between machine intelligence and um, human intelligence, um, because these knowledge graphs are, on the one hand, um, yeah, can interact also with the machine intelligence, and we as humans uh, can look at the knowledge graph and scrutinize the information there. Maybe I show you briefly, but I guess most of you know what knowledge graphs are. Um, here is an example or short excerpt from Ebipedia on the right hand side. Um, so we have these entities and relationships between these entities and attributes. And uh, this originated actually also here in Leipzig at the University of Leipzig. We started the Ebipedia project with some partners also, um, also at the time when I was in Pennsylvania. So um, uh, UPenn was also a bit involved there. And um, 
Um, DBpedia became maybe one of the largest and first large knowledge graphs. Um, meanwhile, we have, uh, and that's what you see here on the left-hand side, a whole cloud of um, uh, knowledge graphs. So here, each of the bubbles is actually a knowledge graph in itself. So there are billions of facts out there and um, thousands of, of these kind of knowledge graphs which can be used freely um, especially also in life sciences, bibliographic and, and um, um, information science knowledge graphs are, are a lot out there. Um, also geospatial knowledge graphs, so many domains are already quite well covered there. So knowledge graphs um, typically use a formal knowledge representation uh, paradigm like RDF, RDF schema OWL, and that makes them also a bit different from property graphs yeah, or new for j for example. Um, and they are holistic, uh, they cover multiple domains, multiple sources, different levels of granularity, um, and you can represent their instance data, schema data, metadata, in according to a unified information schema, also links and mappings. And there are many companies building knowledge graphs out there. Um, I myself also um, uh, co-founded the company Essenza, which is based here uh, just uh, a few meters or 100 meters uh, away. They work also with uh, Siemens, Bosch, and many other companies, for example, on uh, building these enterprise and knowledge graphs. Um, but of course, there is a big potential of leveraging them also for scientific uh, discovery. And before I come to that, I want to maybe summarize a bit what are the advantages and disadvantages of um, these language models, for example, and um, knowledge graphs. So language models are very good at text processing, text extraction, summarization, translation, generation of text, uh, but they have absolutely no concept of facts. Um, they still get it often or sometimes right, um, especially when in the training data, they see a lot of uh, the same examples. Yeah, Then they can replicate these kind of factual information quite well. Um, but for example, if you ask them about the CV of a person, um, in my case, now they also learned not to answer such questions. So they first search then for information and then uh, retrieve the information and then summarize it. Uh, but uh, if you use just the language model alone, it would maybe um, uh, come up with this um, 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 proper stations of your CV, but it would not have the right order and the uh, the things would be quite um, messed up and mixed um, there. Also, these language models are pretty much black boxes. Uh, they might contain hidden biases, um, often also a bit superficial, um, computational expensive to train um, and also to fine tune and query. But maybe the last two things are not so um, important anymore because, of course, we have computing resources get um, cheaper every year. That's why the querying or inference is not um, is maybe still 100 times more expensive than just doing a database query or a knowledge graph query or a web search. Um, but even that is not uh, very expensive nowadays. Knowledge graphs, on the other hand, are very good at knowledge representation, integration. They are human and machine readable, so we can scrutinize them and validate. They're also quite transparent. Um, the provenance uh, can be traced if it was properly added. Um, in in some regard, they scale well, but not so much maybe with regard to the manual integration curation effort. Yeah, so and um, these are maybe also some opportunities for integrating uh, both uh, together. Uh, when knowledge graphs represent a base of validated, trustworthy knowledge, um, they can help us to organize, integrate um, uh, knowledge from various sources, and also provide, of course, input for domain-specific training, fine-tuning of language models. And language models, on the other hand, um, can help curating knowledge in the, in the graphs so by suggesting things, recommending, they can create mappings, queries, and become something like a front end for um, human interaction with the knowledge graph. And um, um, I also see actually this combination, this new symbolic um, integration, a pathway to artificial general intelligence um, um, like that the, for example, the, the step uh, after just using pure generative AI is that we integrate um, additional context information, for example, by retrieval augmented generation 
if we integrate structured knowledge, uh, then uh, we could call this knowledge augmented generation. And I will show you um, in a few minutes some example in that regard. And if we teach then also the uh, models to use external tools such as reasoners, APIs, computation services, um, this could be called like agentic uh, generation and ultimately maybe at some point um, when we add also self-reflection, goal setting and some other things uh, to something um, like artificial general intelligence, which completely resembles what humans also can, can do. Um, but now coming a bit, this was uh, maybe a bit about um, uh, AI now. How um, can we use that in the scientific discovery context? And uh, if we look a bit at different domains, uh, they have completely disrupted over the last 20, 30 years. Yeah, mail order catalogs um, don't exist anymore. Street maps, phone books, um, encyclopedias. And um, they were replaced by digital services, but not just by pseudo digitized artifacts. For example, you would never use a PDF scan of a street map to navigate from A to B or a PDF scan of a mail order catalog uh, where the prices are fixed for a whole year to order something. Um, but we have developed um, digital services basically there for these information domains, and they are developed uh, from the ground up. Um, also, the business model changed. Um, we have a lot of new possibilities. There is more focus on data interlinking. Crowdsourcing plays a big role, um, data curation. Um, but if we look at um, scientific discovery and of scholarly communication, and this is a very important um, area. Yeah, so we spent um, on research and development 1.7 trillion worldwide. So it is not million, not billion, but trillion. And I would actually say that a large share of this is not invested uh, properly because we still use these kind of antique methods of representing scientific information in static uh, documents. Uh, which are hard actually to process and to um, yeah, uh, make, make, uh, make sense of. Um, AI can hardly uh, assist us there. And for researchers, they are often drowning in this uh, flood of, of publications. Yeah. So um, I think only in science and technology, every year, 3 million new publications are published. Yeah. And there are some studies which claim that a large share of this is also not, not cited. Um, we have a peer review um, crisis, uh, reproducibility is severely impaired. Um, and of course, we have now quite some attention on research data. Um, but there's also a bit the danger that we end up with a data swamp instead of a nicely organized data lake. So this is a bit um, depressing, yeah? Um, maybe I skip this one. Um, also, the flood of, of publications, basically, um, you all probably have experienced that if you search for something on Google Scholar and discovery systems, you find huge amounts of, of um, uh, results. And then if you are interested in very specific aspects, um, it's quite quite hard to, um, to make sense and to search for um, yeah, uh, quite specific information in this huge pile of, of um, uh, scientific publications out there. So now the question is, how can we fix that? And what role can scientific um, discovery play there? And um, also, of course, this vision of um, uh, using artificial intelligence for that uh, uh, dates back to shortly after World War II already, yeah, when Vannevar Bush wrote his um, influential famous article, as we may think, uh, where he envisioned this uh, Memex, memory extender. I would say for the time, uh, shortly after World War II, this was, was quite esoteric uh, uh, thing, like a magic desk, which uh, brings the information you need to your fingertips um, and uh, everything is stored uh, in this uh, magic desk there. But I think nowadays we actually have the ingredients to, to build something like this. Um, and one step in this direction we go, um, at TIB, but also with, with partners um, um, with this um, open research knowledge graph um, initiative. And there, uh, the idea is to organize uh, concepts like the research problems, the definitions, research approaches, methods, different types of artifacts, uh, but then also domain specific uh, concepts um, like uh, definitions, theorems, proofs in mathematics and physics experiments, data models. 
um, substances, structures, reactions, and chemistry, and so on and so forth in some kind of um, knowledge graph, yeah, where you have um, these concepts and the relationships between these concepts um, represented, where they are first class citizens, and um, where you then can uh, better scrutinize the information, and where also hopefully AI can assist us in a, in a better way. So that's what we work on with the open research knowledge graph. And um, before talking a lot about it, I want to maybe show you um, a live demo of um, how this works. Um, yeah, you can see the screen. So, and we recently added actually a feature. We learned a bit that it's still, although we've um, worked in the last five years, um, we had a five year anniversary in spring of the Open Research North Graph. We learned that despite we tried to make it as easy as possible for researchers to describe their research findings in the graph, uh, still the entrance barrier is a bit high. And we then worked on something combining exactly language models and um, embeddings and um, um, retrieval, which is called ASK. So um, ask.orkg.org. And you can try this out. Um, looks like that here. Like, I'm accepting here the cookies. Larger. So you can, you can see there, and you can ask any uh, research question here. And we basically try um, to answer your question based on 76 uh, million publications, which we have indexed in a semantic database. So this is not just keyword search, but really a search using these kind of embeddings, which I have shown you. Um, and so if you are interested, you can just type your, your question here. We have prepared uh, some uh, or some example questions down here. So let's maybe click on one. And once you um, ask your question, um, we retrieve the most relevant publications. Um, and you have these publications basically down here. Uh, so this is the first publication here. Why is nature beneficial? The role of connectedness to nature. Is nature relatedness associated with better mental and physical health? Is here the second. Um, so you see, these are already seem to be quite relevant for the for the question we were asking. How does exposure to nature affect overall health and well-being? Uh, so and these um, basically results come exactly from such a vector database. So we have indexed all these um, 76 million documents um, using an embedding model in the vector database, and we retrieve then the most relevant ones. So it's not just a keyword search, um, uh, but uh, it really um, takes also a bit the, the meaning and the semantics into account and finds synonyms uh, because these kind of embedding models have this implicit understanding um, of, um, of concepts. And what we then do after retrieving here the five um, most relevant publication, uh, we feed them into a language model. Um, and that's uh, what you see here on top. Um, and uh, ask the language model to synthesize an answer based on this publication. And here um, you can see that the answer is exposure to nature as shown in multiple studies. And then you have also citations. Uh, they basically um, uh, refer to the uh, related, uh, to the ones which were retrieved here can lead to increased positive emotion, enhanced um, attentional capacity, improved ability, and so on and so forth. Um, these benefits may be attributed uh, to the restorative properties of nature, which reduce stress, and the resulting improvement in air quality, promotion, and physical activity, and so on. So you see, sounds um, quite like a, a reasonable answer um, to, to this question. And um, this is generated uh, by an open source LLM. So we are also not dependent here on ChatGPT or commercial services, but we uh, this runs in the PIB computing center and we use Mistral there, an open source language model, and not even the largest version, but a relatively small one to generate these kind of uh, summaries. Um, but we also extract um, information from the individual publications. So we also try to extract an answer from each of the publications, also the key insights. Um, the, I can scroll here to the right. Ah, we have the mouse here. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah. 
right? I have the last shift button. So a TLDR summary is extracted, conclusions, results from these individual papers, methods um, they were, were using. And this we do basically for all the top five in that case, but you can also load more um, of the most relevant um, uh, publication. If you are not happy with one of the answers here, I don't know if there is something we are not happy with. We can actually click on regenerate. Uh, here you see the small um, um, button there in each cell. You can then click on regenerate cell content and then the language model basically runs the query again um, and then we get a slightly different um, answer uh, to that. Um, we also have um, here, on, of course, the metadata, uh, the DOI links. Uh, if you have the full text uh, for around 19 million publications, we have also the full text. Um, then you can directly also access the full text. Um, and of course, what we extract here is relatively generic, like conclusions, results, methods, and so on. Um, but you can also, we also show a warning here on top that you, of course, have to be quite careful. Um, because the language model might hallucinate. We try to reduce it because we don't ask the question directly to the language model, but we uh, first retrieve the most relevant uh, articles and then we give this as context information to the language model. And that's why uh, the hallucinations might be significantly reduced to just using the language model um, alone. Yeah, But still, uh, you have to be very careful and uh, check and validate everything also by yourself. I'm clicking on Reddit. Um, you can also edit the columns. So here you see the columns, which basically perform the extractions. And what could we add here? I don't know if that makes sense. Type of health, for example, yeah, which might be improved by, by nature. Um, since I'm not an expert here in this particular type of research, uh, I'm not sure it makes sense. I can also drag and drop these. And then uh, an additional column appears here, type of health. Um, and then it extracts actually exactly this information I was asking for. So mental health, emotional well-being makes a lot of sense. Yeah. So these um, physical health, um, of course, nature can also help with physical health. And it basically extracts here what these particular publications, what type of health they refer to. And then you can do some domain-specific extraction of um, the information um, here um, in these publications. Also on the left-hand side, you have like filters. You can filter by year, for example, if you want to only have recent publications by language, um, or you can of course also do additional topics there. You can uh, filter by impact. Um, or a citation count, for example, if you want to have only publications which are cited more than 10 times, um, you can add such a filter. And then uh, the vector database basically retrieves only um, publications with more than 10 citations. And could be that the quality is a bit higher because apparently more researchers found these publications uh, useful. So you can also click on the individual publications and then you get um, more information. Like here you have the, the DOI, the metadata, the publisher, uh, the abstract, the extracted data again here on the right-hand side, and then also related items below. And uh, the citation count, uh, you can then also, for example, cite it and you have all these different uh, citation formats available. Um, you can open the full text here via the link, via various um, linking services. Um, you can, if you are logged in, I'm not logged in here right now, but you can also bookmark that. And uh, then you have basically a library. And in the library, you can store your questions you were asking, your queries, but also individual uh, publications. You can even also upload uh, a BibTeX uh, file, for example, and then perform uh, the questions on uh, your BibTeX uh, library. Yeah, so this is um, ORKG Ask. Um, and um, our aim is, of course, that when you um, uh, uh, answer such questions, that you then uh, maybe revise, um, extract more information. And that's something we are currently also working on uh, so that it can be stored persistently once you 
reviewed basically the answers and the results, and maybe you added some more content and more extractions um, that you stored in the Open Research Knowledge Graph. And maybe I show you a quick example of the Open Research Knowledge Graph as well, it's the classic um, or KV or D. Um, so, and here we have, we call these uh, comparisons of the state of the art. I'll try to increase here also the size a bit. So, for example, you can go to different fields of science here. You can go to engineering. You have all kinds of subfields of engineering. And below, you basically have already curated overviews of the state of the art, which a bit resemble what these questions in ask are. Um, for example, one question is, how can we transition um, our energy systems towards completely renewable energy to become carbon neutral? And uh, there we created a comparison in NFDI for engineering and NFDI for energy, um, which exactly um, juxtaposes the different studies which were performed on um, uh, energy transition. And um, here we have also uh, such a structured overview. Basically here, uh, the publications are in columns. So the first study, for example, is um, Klimaneutrales Deutschland. And then we have Wasserstoff Roadmap Nordrhein-Westfalen and so on and so forth. Since this is a topic related to Germany, uh, the publications are also written in, in German here. But we represented the information then in the knowledge graph, not everything in these papers, but the most important things like what energy sources do they consider, for example, bioenergy, geothermics, hydropower, net import, and so on. And what scenarios do they assume? So the first one, for example, 100% CO2 reduction to 2050, second one only 95. And this is represented, looks like a table, a bit like the Excel table, but it's actually really a knowledge graph. And when you mouse over here, you should actually see that these are resources and they have identifiers and they are, this is just a, a simplified view of the um, knowledge graph, which is there in the back. And since we now have such a um, 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 machine readable representation of the content, uh, we can also ask a question or even uh, generate uh, visualizations. For example, here, how much capacity uh, do we need to become carbon neutral? And then you have, according to the different studies, basically the assessment, how much installed capacity in gigawatt is required. And you can see there are some outliers um, above and below, but um, more or less 400, 500 gigawatt um, might maybe be sufficient there. And this is something, for example, for politicians, or if you um, want to get an overview over research in a certain area, uh, this helps you quite, quite a lot to get a quick, quick overview. And um, um, this, unfortunately, the bad news is that uh, these kind of um, comparisons, they cannot fully uh, create a fully automated way. We, of course, work on that. We have several research teams working on extracting information, um, but we actually want to integrate um, export sourcing, um, curation, manual curation also in the process. Um, so you can also, when you click on um, a particular um, paper or article study here, you then see um, the respective entry. And um, these are, uh, then you see here basically the um, contribution and the different statements. So these are RDF um, subject predicate object statements in the end. And if you are signed in, you can actually edit them and um, create and validate the information. You can also discuss. They have your discussion feature um, and you can also see uh, the timeline, who has edited uh, what at what, what time, for example. So that's a bit of symbolic um, representation. I was showing you with ask a bit a more neural approach, yeah, using embeddings and language models. Here in the classic ORKD, we have a symbolic representation. And now, of course, we need to get this uh, closer together. So I, our idea is, as I mentioned, when you ask a question and ask that you can then, and you actually can do this, there's the ORKG button. So you can then basically store it in the ORKG, create it. And uh, these kind of comparisons, they can also be published in the ORKG again as scientific publications. So um, maybe that's something I can show you as well. You saw here also on top of the comparison, basically some metadata like authors, 
uh, DOIs, um, and so on. So this should appear here on top. Yeah, you see here um, the the uh, metadata who contributed basically to this comparison. Um, there is also a an, an summary um, and uh, the DOI. So it's formally also published, uh, but it's um, not just a static PDF, but if a new study, for example, appears, we can just add it relatively easily and we have a more living um, type of publication. Yeah, So which can be, um, can evolve over time and is not fixed as a PDF document forever. Good. So that was um, the overview of quick overview of the Open Research Knowledge Graph and all KG Ask. So I can skip maybe some of my um, slides here. Of course, it's also linked to other uh, knowledge graphs. These are just some examples. So we have in the OKG, we use Crossref, for example, we use Altmetric as well. Data sites, geonames, Wikidata, and many other knowledge graphs or information bases out there. Um, and maybe I show you um, quickly also the architecture of of Ask again. We have this paper corpus. Um, you probably ask where do we get these publications from? These are all open access uh, currently. We of course now also negotiate with publishers. Um, so we started with Wiley, for example. They want to give us also access to the metadata and the abstracts. We need at least the abstracts. Yeah, We don't need the full text, but without the abstract, just the title is typically not sufficient for really training or um, loading, doing the semantic uh, search. So that's why we included um, only papers where we can get at least the abstract. And we use the core corpus. Uh, there is at the Open University, Peter Knoll, they um, developed this open access aggregator and core, and uh, we basically get uh, the 76 million from from four, and they are also updated continuously. As I said, we also try now to have more also uh, proprietary content from publishers in there. That's the paper corpus, and then we have this um, um, here is traditional search system, but I would say it's a um, it's a semantic uh, search system. We use um, this vector database uh, quadrant. We use language models and also knowledge graphs. And um, on the integration, we, of course, uh, also need to, to work a bit more there. So I think I've showed you here most of the features already. So I can, can skip this. Um, here's uh, actually, this is a screenshot of the library, uh, which you can create yourself for, for the publications. And you also have for the, if you have the full text, you have this PDF links and you can just click on it and you will get access to the full text. And here's a bit the technical architecture. So we basically um, ingest, um, we use this embedding model um, to create these kind of embeddings. They are stored in this nomic vector database. Then we use um, um, retrieve the top n documents, top five by default, but you can increase it to 10, 15, 20 if you want. Um, then we use the language model with some prompts to um, um, ask the question um, based on the uh, retrieved relevant documents, yeah, and then uh, generate the answer. And I can also quickly show you here how the prompts look like. Uh, so the first prompt is actually two prompts only, one for the properties, um, so we ask for the properties like a summary, conclusions, methods, and these kind of things. Um, and um, uh, then the uh, language model basically returns uh, the extracted properties based on the paper abstract. Sometimes we also feed the first page or the conclusions page of the full text in, but typically not the full full text. And uh, the prompt B is the one which synthesizes the answer then. So there we give it all the relevant abstracts and titles of the papers and then ask for the synthesis. And uh, basically in the prompt, you also give examples how it should cite the references, how it should do these kind of things. Um, so that's how ask basically works. Yeah, and um, I think my time is uh, slowly running out. So. Um, uh, maybe just very briefly, of course, we try to involve the human and in the loop and also the machine in the loop to have this um, crowdsourcing and um, um, or expert uh, sourcing there. So with the machine in the loop, basically the machine assists the human in doing something with the human in the loop. 
um, the human basically gives some feedback to machine extracted information. And we have developed a lot of techniques in the OKG. You can usually see them uh, with these kind of, um, what's the color? Um, not green, right? Um, uh, the, uh, these these colored uh, items in the, uh, for example, suggest an, a research problem here or so, solution or method. So there, um, the language model basically based on a publication um, helps you adding information to the open research node run. You can also ask for more properties before we feel so, uh, smart suggestions basically, or you can annotate the abstract um, also uh, of a paper. Um, you have some special abstract annotator interface there. So we have developed many techniques to have the human in the loop or where human and machine collaborate, because this I think is also very important that we not just rely on even on the uh, like neural symbolic stuff or AI, but we also of course need to always scrutinize, validate and verify um, the information. Yeah, so this was giving um, a quick overview on the OKG. And of course, we have a large team, which I would like to acknowledge here as well. So there are many people involved. And we would be very interested also collaborate with you, the Open Research Node Graph, and ask it's all completely open source, open data, open science. You can get all the source code, um, all the uh, data sets um, are freely available. We also have a community management team. So if you have some ideas uh, for, for example, creating content in a specific domain or connecting it to specific services. Uh, we would be interested um, to, to work on that together. Um, and the two guys who worked on Ask are here, Alad Erlen, he's the head of our front end uh, development and Yasa Jarade, uh, he developed also this embedding or deploy these embedding models and this vector search. Um, they were PhD students with us, and now they are postdocs and engineers, software research engineers. Um, so we try to continuously um, update and improve these, these kind of services. Good, so that uh, concludes uh, my talk. I think we need to reinvent not only scientific discovery, but uh, scholarly communication in general. Um, I think knowledge graphs are perfectly suited uh, to capture research contributions and interact, also integrate this generative AI there. Um, and um, But of course, we need this synergistic combination of human expert and machine intelligence, and this is still a challenge. So we are by far, maybe this was just the first step, but there's a lot of work also ahead of us. Thank you very much for your attention. And I hope we have some time for questions.